Tonight, I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Scott Kahan. Dr. Kahan got his uh, bachelor's in biomedical engineering at Columbia University and received his medical degree from Drexel Uni College of Medicine. He completed his residency at Johns Hopkins, where he served as chief resident, and he also uh, received his master's in public health from Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. Scott is only one of seven physicians worldwide who are board certified in both preventive medicine and obesity medicine. He's uh, director of the George Washington University-based Strategies to Overcome and Prevent Obesity Alliance, whose purpose is to uh, advance the public conversation about obesity and develop practical strategies to combat obesity and weight bias. He is also founder and director of the National Center uh, for Weight and Wellness in Washington, D.C., which provides clinical treatment for obesity and weight reduction health issues. Uh, Dr. Kahan is one of the uh, real stars in this area in the country, and uh, we're privileged to have him uh, here tonight to speak to us. Scott. So we'll talk a little bit about inflammation and obesity today, and I want to keep it at, at uh, uh, a big picture level. There's so much detail, and so much detail that we really don't even know still, uh, but I think that thinking about it from a big picture perspective can, can really lead to uh, a valuable uh, set of insights uh, into how these things play out together uh, and then also uh, leads us into a couple of take home messages that I think might be valuable for you. Let's start with an exercise. Uh, if you can stand up, let's do that. You don't have to. If you, if you want to sit in place, that's perfectly fine. But what I want to do right now is have us all either jog in place or, or you can just sort of you know, pick up your, your feet like this or sort of move back and forth. I, just, I want to be moving a little bit. And there's a reason for this beyond just it's good for us all to get some exercise. But let's, let's just hop up and down a little bit. Just move a little bit. It's kind of fun too, especially after a busy day sitting in front of the computer screen. I haven't moved all day. Okay, we can stop now. All right. Now take a seat, and now here's what I want you to do. When I count to three, I want you to take a really deep breath, and I want you to hold it in as deep as you can. One, two, deep breath. And we're going to hold it for a minute and a half. <laughs> you can start again if that made you laugh. Deep breath. Let's just hold it. I'm looking at that clock there. We're at about seven seconds right now. Keep going. It's tough, huh? We're at about 15 seconds. Okay, you can, you can uh, exhale now. Why am I starting by talking about this? Why is it so hard for us to do something as simple as just holding our breath? Well, our body fights against it. We can do it for a few seconds, maybe we can even do it for a minute. But eventually, your body notices that something's wrong. Your oxygen levels go down, your carbon dioxide levels go up, your body has uh, uh, very sensitive sensors for carbon dioxide, and when that happens, uh, there are signals that are sent back to the brain, and the brain takes in all that's going on and kind of sort of says, hey, you're suffocating. Breathe, you moron. And that's what you do. And you can white knuckle past the, uh, the pain and the uncomfortableness of holding your breath in for a few seconds, maybe a few tens of seconds, maybe a minute, maybe a minute and a half if, you're, if you've got really strong willpower, if you will, I suppose. Uh, but eventually you're gonna take a breath because your body thinks you're suffocating and it takes over. Okay, so let's take this back to weight. A very analogous situation happens uh, when it comes to weight and weight loss. Okay, so you decide maybe it's, it's uh, New Year's or for whatever reason you decide to go on that diet. You get all your Jenny Craig food together or whatever it is. You get your Atkins book ready to go. You plan it out. You, you, you uh, get the food and so forth and you start your diet. 
and it's going great. And you're losing weight, and then you start exercising, you go into the gym, you're getting, uh, you have lots of energy, you're getting a lot of good feedback from your friends and your family members, a week goes by, two, three, four weeks go by, and everything's going great. But then something happens, and it happens over the course of a few days to a few weeks to even a few months. A little bit longer time period than with the example of holding your breath, but very much analogous. Slowly your body, as it sees what's going on, as it's taking in uh, all of the different surveillance uh, pieces of your body, uh, it realizes that you're effectively starving, or at least it thinks that you're starving. Your fat cells are getting smaller. Your, uh, your, uh, uh, a number of other uh, uh, messages say to your brain that you're starving. And then your brain says, well, I'm not going to let you starve. I'm going to push against that because for the vast majority of our existence, starving was far more of an issue than, than excess nutrition, than overnutrition. And so there's a number of uh, pathways by which this happened, but, but it happens extremely strongly, especially after the first little bit of it. So one example of, of what... Uh, uh, of what mediates this is a hormone called leptin. Many of you have probably heard of that by now. It's a hormone that's specifically made by fat cells. One, and it does a whole bunch of things throughout the body. One of the key things that it does is it uh, uh, communicates the level of fat cells in your body, the level of backup uh, fuel store stores in your body. And so as you're losing weight and your fat cells are getting smaller, you're making less leptin. And as your brain notices that and registers that, that's again one of the key signals that suggests that you are losing weight and in theory starving. And so your brain then tries to counteract that and it does it in part by lowering metabolic rate because why waste energy if you're, if you're getting low on energy? And it also does it by upregulating a number of hormones and other chemicals that increase appetite. So it's, it's goading you, it's pushing you to eat more. And that's what happens. It's very much analogous to what happens with the suffocation example. Your brain tells you to eat because you're starving. Let's look a little bit closer at one of the pieces of this that's happening. In the hypothalamus, the hypothalamus is one of the key brain areas where this is happening, particularly in uh, the sort of appetite center there. Uh, and you can see here, here's the example. Normally there's a balance of the gas pedal, if you will, to eat more with the brake pedal to eat less. And it's sort of balanced out very nice. As you lose weight and there becomes less uh, signals of leptin from the from the blood from the fat cells uh, that signal from leptin goes to the hypothalamus and the two main neurons that uh, that are effectively this brake and and gas pedal on eating is called the POMC neurons when that's stimulated you tend to eat less and the NPY and a GUDI related protein neurons and when those are stimulated you tend to eat more, okay? So uh, again, in this example, it's mediated through leptin. There's many, many, many other hormones and chemicals that play into this. I put a couple others in here. I put this in here just because I think it's interesting. Uh, this is ghrelin. It's a hormone made in your stomach. Uh, it's particularly important when it comes to bariatric surgery. So we used to think that bariatric surgery mostly worked by cutting out part of your stomach and therefore you can't eat that much because you get full quicker and that's why you lose weight. And now we know that that's a very small piece uh, of why you lose weight. A much bigger piece is that when you cut out a part of your stomach, it changes the expression of ghrelin and again through similar pathways, ultimately through these, uh, these uh, neuronal systems, you end up eating less. And eventually we're probably going to have drugs that, that can mimic this and some of these other uh, pathways, but I think it's important to keep it in there. Again, there's many, many uh, pathways that work in here, but this is a really important one uh, when it comes to leptin. So let's look at 
a version of this scenario where even if you're not necessarily losing weight, there becomes an imbalance in the POMC and NPY neurons such that you end up having much more signals to eat more and also uh, signals to lower metabolic rate. And one of the ways that we're now learning that this happens is when there's inflammation that occurs inside the hypo hypothalamic uh, neuronal areas. And that messes up effectively this balance between the break in the gas uh, to eat more or eat less. All right, so uh, one of the key studies in this area was with mice, and what they did was feed, feed mice a high fat diet, and that instituted uh, inflammation in this hypothalamic area, which led to the mice uh, gaining weight. Uh, so we have here just a little example of that. Uh, this is, you have BMI here, or body weight here, and then you have uh, what is effectively a signal of how much inflammation is happening in the hypothalamic area. For those mice that experienced inflammation in their hypothalamus, they ended up gaining more weight compared with those mice that did not experience that same uh, inflammation in their hypothalamus. So this inflammation in a key brain area we're now learning is a strong determinant of and driver of the beginning and progression of obesity. This is something that's brand new. We knew for a long time that there's more to all of this than just, again, white knuckling through diets and having a lot of willpower to exercise more and eat less. And now we're starting to understand a lot more about the chemical nature of that, about the physiologic nature of that. And so uh, soon this will be replicated in humans. Uh, there's numerous other uh, pathways that are being studied and we're already seeing more and more of, of this data and hopefully we'll have a number of treatments for it. But it's a, it's a great example of how inflammation plays into uh, the situation of obesity. What we normally think of and what we have lots more data on is the opposite end of that. So here we're learning that inflammation can cause or predispose to the development of obesity. What we've known for a long time is that obesity causes inflammation and that's likely the main mediator by which obesity causes uh, other chronic diseases uh, and such. So, so here's an example of, of what's happening in fat cells uh, as most people gain weight. Doesn't happen in everybody as you gain weight, but in most people. So here you have sort of a healthy fat cell. Uh, there's not much inflammatory chemicals that are being made. Uh, there's not much of a negative effect on the blood vessels that are going through it. And then as you go to the right here, these are fat cells that have a, a bunch of pro-inflammatory mediators that are being created. There's a whole bunch of signals that are being, uh, that are starting in those fat cells, these sick fat cells, if you will, that then go out to the rest of the body and carry these inflammation signals to the rest of the body. Uh, and so it's in those fat cells and in those people that, uh, that show those fat cells that ultimately develop the uh, diseases associated with obesity. So for example, when inflammation, uh, when inflammation, uh, uh, inflammatory signals increase in the liver, uh, you end up storing more fat in the liver, you end up creating inflammation in the liver, and that ends up predisposing to diabetes, for example. Uh, same thing with a number of other uh, tissues in the body, uh, but it all comes back to this concept of inflammation that's driving so much uh, of the chronic diseases that occur from obesity. And so one of the things you, you've probably read about on Huffington Post or in the newspaper is that there are some people that gain a lot of weight and yet they don't show any of the health problems down the line uh, of that obesity. So there's about 10 or 15 percent of people that have obesity and yet don't develop, even decades down the line, don't develop the health problems that are typically associated with obesity. And one of the key reasons for that is that they don't have the same inflammatory drive 
caused by that obesity that other people have. So on the one hand, addressing weight is certainly one of the ways that we want to go about this. But on the other hand, simply addressing the mediator of obesity can have as powerful effects as addressing the obesity itself.